This is Belinda Miller. I'm here in Salopi, Turkey. I'd like to say hello to everyone back in Rochester, New York, especially my mom, my dad, um, Jamie Miller, Elizabeth Miller, Valerie, Patricia Miller, and I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. To our world, peace on earth from CNN. This is CNN Breaking News. Good evening, I'm Gene Randall in Washington. We are standing by for an Oval Office address by President Bush. As he contributes to a day even historians may have trouble describing. A day when Mikhail Gorbachev resigned as the president of a Soviet Union which had already ceased to exist. The new power broker, Russian President Boris Yeltsin. In a statement issued a short time ago, President Bush praised Gorbachev for what he called his years of sustained commitment to world peace. He also spoke of his intellect, vision and courage. The two men spoke by phone before Gorbachev delivered his televised resignation speech. Mr. Bush will look ahead to a future of dealing with the new Commonwealth of Independent States, and we are told now the President will go ahead with formal recognition of those republics, notably Russia. We'll be back after the President's address, which we understand will be fairly brief. Now the President of the United States. Good evening, and Merry Christmas to all Americans across our great country. During these last few months, you and I have witnessed one of the greatest dramas of the 20th century, the historic and revolutionary transformation of a totalitarian dictatorship, the Soviet Union, and the liberation of its peoples. As we celebrate Christmas, this day of peace and hope, I thought we should take just a few minutes to reflect on what these events mean for us as Americans. For over 40 years, the United States led the West in the struggle against communism and the threat it posed to our most precious values. This struggle shaped the lives of all Americans. It forced all nations to live under the specter of nuclear destruction. That confrontation is now over. The nuclear threat, while far from gone, is receding. Eastern Europe is free. The Soviet Union itself is no more. This is a victory for democracy and freedom. It's a victory for the moral force of our values. Every American can take pride in this victory, from the millions of men and women who served our country in uniform, to millions of Americans who supported their country and a strong defense under nine presidents. New, independent nations have emerged out of the wreckage of the Soviet Empire, Last weekend, these former republics formed a Commonwealth of Independent States. This act marks the end of the old Soviet Union, signified today by Mikhail Gorbachev's decision to resign as president. I'd like to express on behalf of the American people my gratitude to Mikhail Gorbachev for years of sustained commitment to world peace and for his intellect, vision, and courage. I spoke with Mikhail Gorbachev this morning. We reviewed the many accomplishments of the past few years and spoke of hope for the future. Mikhail Gorbachev's revolutionary policies transformed the Soviet Union. His policies permitted the peoples of Russia and the other republics to cast aside decades of oppression and establish the foundations of freedom. His legacy guarantees him an honored place in history and provides a solid basis for the United States to work in equally constructive ways with his successors. The United States applauds and supports the historic choice for freedom by the new states of the Commonwealth. We congratulate them on the peaceful and democratic path they have chosen and for their careful attention to nuclear control and safety during this transition. Despite a potential for instability and chaos, these events clearly serve our national interest. We stand tonight before a new world of hope and possibilities for our children, a world we could not have contemplated a few years ago. The challenge for us now is to engage these new states in sustaining the peace and building a more prosperous future. And so today, based on commitments and assurances given to us by some of these states concerning nuclear safety, 
democracy, and free markets, I am announcing some important steps designed to begin this process. First, the United States recognizes and welcomes the emergence of a free, independent, and democratic Russia led by its courageous president, Boris Yeltsin. Our embassy in Moscow will remain there as our embassy to Russia. We will support Russia's assumption of the USSR's seat as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. I look forward to working closely with President Yeltsin in support of his efforts to bring democratic and market reform to Russia. Second, the United States also recognizes the independence of Ukraine, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Kyrgyzstan, all states that have made specific commitments to us. We will move quickly to establish diplomatic relations with these states and build new ties to them. We will sponsor membership in the United Nations for those not already members. Third, the United States also recognizes today as independent states the remaining six former Soviet republics, Moldova, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Tajikistan, Georgia, and Uzbekistan. We will establish diplomatic relations with them when we are satisfied that they have made commitments to responsible security policies and democratic principles, as have the other states we recognize today. These dramatic events come at a time when Americans are also facing challenges here at home. I know that for many of you, these are difficult times, and I want all Americans to know that I'm committed to attacking our economic problems at home with the same determination we brought to winning the Cold War. I'm confident we will meet this challenge as we have so many times before, but we cannot if we retreat into isolationism. We will only succeed in this interconnected world by continuing to lead the fight for free people and free and fair trade. A free and prosperous global economy is essential for America's prosperity. That means jobs and economic growth right here at home. This is a day of great hope for all Americans. Our enemies, have become our partners, committed to building democratic and civil societies. They ask for our support, and we will give it to them. We will do it because, as Americans, we can do no less. For our children, we must offer them the guarantee of a peaceful and prosperous future, a future grounded in a world built on strong democratic principles, free from the specter of global conflict. May God bless the people of the new nations in the Commonwealth of Independent States. And on this special day of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, may God continue to bless the United States of America. Good night. President Bush from the Oval Office tonight, extending formal recognition to Russia and five other former Soviet republics, praising Russian President Boris Yeltsin as a courageous leader. The president also had warm words from Mikhail Gorbachev, the last president of a now defunct Soviet Union. He called him a man of vision, intellect, and courage. Listening to the president's speech in Moscow is CNN correspondent Eileen O'Connor. Eileen, how do you think Mr. Bush's words will go over with Boris Yeltsin? Boris Yeltsin will find this the best Christmas present he could ever have received. He needed, he wanted diplomatic recognition. That was top of the list for the Russians. That will open them up to IMF assistance, World Bank assistance, um, aid, and also multilateral and bilateral agreements. The uh, Russian Republic also wanted this formal recognition as a symbolic statement on the Commonwealth. They will definitely welcome Mr. Bush's statement that the Commonwealth of Independent States is a choice for victory and a victory for democracy and freedom, as he put it. He congratulated the American people for fighting for these kinds of principles and congratulated the Soviet people for choosing them in the end. Boris Yeltsin will find those words most gratifying. He said today that he, the people here needed hope. They needed to believe in something. He will use these words by Mr. Bush to show the people 
that the outside world is accepting him as a leader, accepting this country as an independent state, and that there is a basis to go forward with this commonwealth, that they need now to push ahead with economic reform, and they definitely need help from the United States in that quest. Gene? Eileen, thanks very much. A nice work by all of you today in the Moscow Bureau. Listening to the president in Atlanta was Daniel Papp, director of the School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech. Dr. Papp, any way to characterize the historical significance of this day? The events of today, the disappearance of the Soviet Union and Gorbachev's resignation, are as significant as the conclusion of World War II and the conclusion of World War I. Historians in the future will have to regard it at that level of significance. And how do you suppose Mr. Bush responded to the events of this day? President Bush's response, from my perspective, was close to perfect. He provided recognition for Yeltsin as I, and for Russia, as Eileen correctly observed, was at the top of the Russians' list. This will open avenues for aid to flow to Russia and to other republics as well. He also used the recognition tool as a way to prod several of the other republics, several of the new, newly independent states, which have not yet agreed to things like human rights and democratization to move them in that direction. This administration, as you know, has been criticized in the past for being something somewhat behind the curve on events in the Soviet Union, for not being ahead of events. But tonight you're saying it understood clearly the nuances of what was at hand. I think so, and I was not one, and I would still not be one, to have criticized the Bush administration for being behind the power curve. The reason for that, we must again think back to how unsure everything was as recently as August of this year. That coup, when it occurred, had the potential to move everything back into the bad old days of the past, of the height of the Cold War. Fortunately, through a combination of strength on the part of Boris Yeltsin, on the part of activism, on the part of Soviet peoples, and I might say also as the result of global media and strong support from outside what was then the Soviet Union, that coup did not succeed. Dr. Papp, on practical terms, how does the United States proceed now? Does it simply proceed with Russia as it would have proceeded with the Soviet Union? We have to proceed, of course, with the more powerful and potentially powerful of the newly independent states of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Here we have to concentrate on Russia very definitely. We also have to concentrate on the Ukraine. I would argue that Kazakhstan, with its mix of Russian peoples and Kazakh peoples, is a potential flashpoint for the future, which will also become very important downline, not only for the United States, not only for, the, for Kazakhstan, but also potentially for the peace of the world as well. And is there a fine line between dealing with Russia on that kind of footing and helping Russia build itself into the kind of behemoth which is feared by many of those other republics? The other republics, the, the newly independent states that came out of what used to be the Soviet Empire and what was before that the Russian Empire, have four or five centuries of fear of Russian imperialism. So there is, in fact, a fine line. I believe Yeltsin, however, has begun moving in exactly the correct direction by guaranteeing territorial in integrity of the other newly independent states. That fear will be there, however, on the part of the other newly independent states that a stronger Russia in the future, at the beginning of the 21st century perhaps, could in fact become once again an imperial Russia. Yeltsin let, is clearly trying to prevent that, however. Let me ask you finally, Dr. Papp. We have known Boris Yeltsin to this point as the leader of the opposition, the very powerful leader of the opposition. Now he has power. Did you see a different Boris Yeltsin today on assuming that mantle of power? Yeltsin for the last several months, actually in the months preceding the coup, from the time in July of this year when he took over as president of Russia, has, I believe, begun to act more statesmanly. He has begun to act with a greater degree of confidence and a greater degree of assertiveness, measuring his words. I believe that was evident again today during his interviews with Steve Hurst. Uh, it is a guy that we are going to have to put our faith in, put our trust in for uh, at least the near-term and mid-term future. I'm told we have a bit more time, so let me ask you about Mikhail Gorbachev. How do you see his legacy? He began all this, didn't he? 
without Mikhail Gorbachev assuming the general secretaryship of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in March of 1985, very little of this, perhaps none of this, would have ever transpired. Mikhail Gorbachev, from my perspective, will go down as one of the truly monumental figures of the 20th century. Dr. Papp, thank you very much. Thank you. And lest we forget, this is a season of presidential politics. President Bush used part of his time tonight on national television to get into presidential politics. He talked about our economic problems at home and attacking those problems with the same determination with which he said we brought to a winning close the Cold War. He also talked against isolationism. And once again, it is a political season. We will, of course, recap this day at the top of the hour, but for now, I'm Gene Randall in Washington. Stay tuned for Larry King Live next. Seems that every time you turn around these days, another pain reliever with ibuprofen in it is comparing itself to Tylenol. But you know what they can't say? They can't say they're gentler than Tylenol, because they're not. Tylenol won't irritate your stomach the way ibuprofen sometimes can. That's a medical fact. And is it any wonder that today hospitals use Tylenol 14 times more than ibuprofen? Tylenol, the pain reliever hospitals use most. Ever tried plaques? Rinsing with plaques before brushing loosens plaque and helps break it up. So you remove more plaque than brushing alone, leaving your teeth cleaner, brighter, and smoother. Break up the plaque with plaques. Here's an eye drop with something extra. A moisturizer for extra relief. Ah. Visine Extra. Cools, soothes, moisturizes, and protects. Visine Extra puts moisturizing relief in, gets the red out. Jack Nicholson's Not Your Average Outlaw. I don't want to hear about it. Marlon Brando's Not Your Average Lawman. <laughs> and they don't exactly get along. I'm gonna bust your fat. Seem like somebody ought to be able to get the job done. One great movie, two legendary stars. The Missouri Breaks. 10.35 Eastern, Sunday morning on TBS. Welcome to Larry King Live. Tonight, life after Gorbachev. The world wonders what comes after the old hammer and sickle. Will the U.S. miss the old reliable rivalry? Now, here's Larry King. Good evening from Washington and Merry Christmas. And while much of the world was distracted today by the business of celebrating Christmas, Mikhail Gorbachev signed himself and the Soviet Union out of business without ruffles or flourishes. The Russian flag has replaced the hammer and sickle over the Kremlin. President Bush and other leaders spoke well of Gorbachev and with good reason. Nobody is sure what happens next in the new Commonwealth of Independent States. From the Russian capital, Moscow, we welcome CNN correspondent Eileen O'Connor. Vice President and former Moscow Bureau Chief Stuart Lurie, who was in the room with Gorbachev today when the USSR passed into history. And I know, Stuart, you have covered that scene a long time. What was it like emotionally? Larry, you can't imagine the scene in that room. Mikhail Gorbachev was relaxed. He sat down at the table. In front of him was just a simple green folder with a few sheets of paper. They were his speech, and they were the document with which he was going to sign away the power. You talked about signing away the power. Uh, I have in my hand the pen that he used to abdicate the presidency of the USSR. Uh, after his huh. speech, he had to sign the document, and uh, his pen did not work. Tom Johnson, the president of CNN, CNN was standing at the table he gave this pen to Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev signed it. Uh, Tom asked him for the pen back. Over here to show to your viewers, Larry. 
You've been there a long time, Stuart, back and forth. You opened our bureau there in 1983. Did you ever, ever think this would happen? Not in uh, my uh, fondest and most serious uh, thoughts did I ever think that I would see uh, the downfall of the communist empire. Uh, until the last couple of years, and then of course as uh, things began to come apart here about two years ago, it began to look like it was really going to happen. But in 1964, when I first arrived here, uh, it was the farthest thing in my, uh, in my mind. Uh, Eileen, repertorially, what kind of story, it's an ongoing obvious story, where do you go with it tomorrow? What now? Well, that's a really interesting question because it's not even sure, you know, they've already talked about the capital of this new Commonwealth is in Minsk. We've joked that we might have to move the bureau to Minsk, but of course <laughs> Russia will remain the big powerhouse here, and it's just going to be a capital where discussions will take place. But repertorially, it's completely different. Already, just, I was here also, and Stuart was here. I came here over six years ago, and repertorially, this has changed so much, you couldn't even fathom. When I first came here, you couldn't talk to people on the street. Mikhail Gorbachev gave a speech saying, let's criticize, self-criticize, glasnost. You went out in the street and said to people, what's wrong with your life? And they said, nothing. What about that line for bread? What line? And then also they talk about just the standard pat answer, which they were given in the newspaper to give to any foreign correspondent, which was, we want peace, mir, and druzhba, peace and friendship. And now you can walk in anywhere, talk to anybody, walk into a store, a factory anywhere before you had to go with minders who would watch everything you filmed and it's completely free i never thought this would happen it's just amazing all right eileen there is freedom is there also confusion definitely confusion you know people here are complete are very very worried they're very concerned about the future after the gorbachev after the gorbachev speech i went home and and actually spoke to my nanny who's a russian and she just said, I shook my head. I couldn't fathom the future without Mikhail Gorbachev. We've come to rely on him so much. And I said, but last week you were complaining that Gorbachev didn't know what to do in the future. And she said, yes, but at least he represented stability. Well, I don't think he knew the way forward. At least he was comfortable for us. The Soviets fear change. Mikhail Gorbachev said himself today yeah. in that statement that there is a big fear of change, and that's a big problem here. And Boris Yeltsin is going to have a big job to do to keep hope alive. There's big price rises coming up. People are scared. P old age pensioners are thinking they're going to go starving in the streets. There is, of course, a Social Security program, but it's not helping the fear. And there's a, a, a big hurdle also to surmount in that 70 years of communism has instituted a lot of, of perhaps bad habits. People here are they don't understand motivation and, and they don't believe that if they work harder they'll get more money. No. They haven't in the past. Stuart, so did you, uh, excuse me, Ellie. a lot of concern. Stuart, did you, um, I understand you saw the nuclear codes transferred to Mr. Yeltsin. Does this mean he has that hand on the button that Mr. Bush has here? Uh, he has the hand on the button and earlier today he told us that his will be the only hand on the button. We saw the transfer in a corridor outside of Mikhail Gorbachev's office. It happened at 7.56 p.m. Uh, we looked around and sure enough there was what uh, the White House calls the football and what they call here the little suitcase. Uh, going down the hall and disappearing out the door and presumably going to Boris Yeltsin's control. Um, Yeltsin is now the man with his finger on the button here. The hammer and the sickle is gone forever? Uh, uh, it looks like it's gone forever, Larry. Behind us back there, uh, the flag of Russia is now flying over the Kremlin. The hammer and sickle is down. Incidentally, I saw a couple of workers, a couple of lowly workers, taking away the flags that came down over the Kremlin. They were taking them home for souvenirs. Where's Mr. Gorbachev going immediately? Do you know, Stuart? Uh, he said he's going to rest a little bit. Uh, and then he is probably going to go to work in a think tank that has already been uh, founded and that will carry his name. It's going to be called the Gorbachev Institute for sure. He says he wants to take part in the uh, continuing part in the political life of this country and of the world. And I think he's going to do it. Eileen, like writing checks that say 1992 instead of 91, are you going to have a hard time not saying the Soviet Union? 
I'm already having a hard time seeing the Soviet <laughs> Union and the Soviet people. For, you know, for the last few years, also, when you went into different republics with people with their newfound freedom and desire for freedom, if you said in the Ukraine that here I am in the Soviet Union or the Soviet Ukraine, they, they said, what do you mean the Soviet Ukraine? This is Ukraine. And we're not Soviets, we're Ukrainians. And the same with Russians. So it's been a dilemma in the last few years, and it's certainly going to continue to be a dilemma now. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll hold Stuart and uh, Eileen. We'll be joined by Michael Beschloss, the historian and student of Soviet affairs here at our studios in Washington. And then in a little while, Wolf Blitzer will be joining us as well. And we're certainly glad Tom Johnson had that pen, or else Corby might have still been there. Who knows with history. Tomorrow night, by the way, we'll continue a discussion on this topic. Also, presidential candidate Pat Buchanan, who may be a little angry at some of the remarks made by the president tonight concerning isolationism. We'll all be back after this. Driver Magazine declared its road manners are in the import vein, but comfort is better. And if you're wondering what else they have to say about the new Oldsmobile 88 Royale, call 1-800-332-OLDS. We'll send you their complete test drive evaluation on video cassette, free. Because when Car and Driver says the new 88 has hit the elusive style mark, it deserves more of your time than we can give it here. Oldsmobile, the power of intelligent engineering. Recently, Stouffer Hotels hosted the chairman of Dow Jones, held a meeting for the president of AT&T, planned a banquet for the CEO of Avis, and welcomed lots of other important presidents, too. In fact, maybe the reason we're one of America's top-rated luxury hotels is that our presidential suites are so often filled with presidents. Stouffer Hotels and Resorts, you can depend on our good name. Da da da! Go ahead, Dad, make a wish. Happy anniversary, Dad. To your fifth year without cancer. Out of every ten people in America who get cancer this year, only four will still be alive in five years. Now, aren't you glad you got a second opinion? We believe you can improve on those odds. Just call Cancer Treatment Centers of America, 1-800-227-3300. It could save the life of someone you love. The world is waiting outside. Inside, there's the good taste of Smucker's. Surprisingly, under 20 calories, and you're not adding any fat. A good way to start your day. With a name like Smucker's, it has to be good. There's a new way to doctor a cough. <clears throat> Robitussin cough drops. Try this, it's new. With an active ingredient that speeds soothing relief to your cough. <coughs> Try this, it's new. New Robitussin cough drops. Cough drops from the cough experts. Larry King Live continues, followed by World News after this local commercial break, next on CNN. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out why people like Wendy's Super Value Menu best. We've got nine delicious choices, just 99 cents each. Like our new Caesar side salad and Junior Cheeseburger Deluxe. Look, our big baked potato is a meal by itself and our junior bacon cheeseburger comes with two strips of bacon. Sometimes I wonder why other places don't offer as much. I guess you have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. Now get nine delicious choices for 99 cents each on the Super Value Menu at Wendy's. Hi, I'm Rosanna Arquette. Millions of people around the world are living with AIDS. You can help them by watching Unfinished Stories, a special event produced by Bravo. Tune in to this global fundraising and educational event on December 1st, World AIDS Day, and every Sunday for the entire month of December to help fight AIDS. Share the challenge. Join us for Unfinished Stories, Bravo's annual tribute to artists and AIDS. To our viewers around the world, peace on earth.
from CNN. Welcome back to Larry King Live, live on this Christmas night in Moscow. Stuart Lurie, CNN vice president who witnessed the resignation speech and who uh, opened the uh, Moscow Bureau for this uh, company in 1983. And Eileen O'Connor, the CNN correspondent based in Moscow, what yeoman-like work they and the rest have done in covering these historic series of events. Joining us here in Washington is Michael Beschloss, historian, student of Soviet affairs. Your thoughts on what Stuart and Eileen just said? Well, it's a day we thought we'd never see, Larry. And I think the amazing thing is that these people have been improvising. We've never seen a leader of this country come in without being preceded by a death or a coup d'etat. It's all happened very nicely. Your, in other words, this is pleasing to you? Pleasing that surprising. it happened without... Pleasing and surprising. If we had thought about this even two years ago, we would have thought that there might have been some bloodshed involved. Stuart, uh, from the television perspective, uh, Mr. Gorbachev looked, looked older. Was that us reading it into him, or are we correct? Not at all, Larry. Uh, the, uh, the events of the past several months have certainly taken their toll on Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, when you see him in person, he does look tired. He does look a little bit older. His eyes are, uh, are darkened and they're lined. And of course, that's to be understood. Uh, Tom Johnson and I saw him last week privately uh, while we were seeking these uh, exclusive interviews that we had with Yeltsin and, and uh, Gorbachev. Uh, and he met us in his office. He did look tired, but he was... Uh, uh, trying his best to put us at ease. And at one point he asked uh, Tom, how is the CNN empire doing? And Tom <laughs> answered, it's doing very well. We had a very good year. Gorbachev said, you've built your empire better than I've built mine. But he went on to say, make sure you pay attention to give enough freedom to your republics. <laughs> Pretty good idea. This is for all three of you, okay. starting, starting with Michael. What are your thoughts on what Mr. Bush had to say? I think he's trying to put the best face on it. This is a president who's been very identified with Mikhail Gorbachev. He wants to make the transition to Yeltsin, but do it in a way that doesn't seem as if he's dropping Gorbachev like a hot rock, because people have memories. The other thing that's amazing is that he almost does not allow himself the luxury of expressing a thought on foreign policy without quickly saying, folks, I'm also worried about the economy. I think we'll see a lot more of that in the next six months. Eileen, what did you think of what the president said? Well, I think it was certainly welcome words for Boris Yeltsin and for the entire Soviet uh, Union, former Soviet <laughs> Union, these, this new Commonwealth of States. Um, they certainly needed that diplomatic recognition. They felt it was a stamp of approval by the international community. Boris Yeltsin particularly, he's always sort of chafed at the fact that, uh, that Pre President Bush hasn't really recognized the power that has gone to the republics. They were very, very taken with the, with the Bush reaction during the summit. You know, uh, Boris Yeltsin did not attend a meeting that Mikhail Gorbachev said he would attend with Mr. Bush in the Kremlin because Boris Yeltsin was told to be there. He was not invited. And the White House thought that was a kind of a snub. Boris Yeltsin said, look, I'm making a statement here. The, I, do not get a, I do not get just told to be someplace. Mm -hmm. I'm the president of an independent republic. And I think that the diplomatic recognition particularly and the fact that Mr. Bush said, I welcome this choice of the people, uh, this commonwealth of states. It was a victory for freedom and democracy. That clearly will be good words for Boris Yeltsin. He can hold those up to the, yeah. to the people here. Stuart, before you Larry, leave, uh, I, yeah, Stuart, your thoughts quickly on Bush, and I want to ask you one other thing. I, I, I think that uh, George Bush was recognizing reality in doing this. He'd much rather deal with only one country, but he realizes mm. he has to deal with many. And by the way, the right thing. will his remarks be fully covered in the press tomorrow in the Soviet Union? Oh, yes, I, I think that that's a certainty that they will. The <laughs> press is much different here from what it was in the past. Uh, many of the newspapers are, are objective and free, and they will cover those remarks very well. And even I said the Soviet Union. Stuart, any particular memories before you leave us and Wolf Blitzer comes in as on this historic night as you look back on all the time you've spent there? Well, Larry, uh, when I came here in 1964, I got here three weeks before Nikita Khrushchev was deposed. Uh, that was a very, very dark time. Uh, the memory that I will have is the memory of the Soviet Union 
disappearing and this new commonwealth of states all of these uh, new countries uh, starting a brand new era after 74 years in, in darkness and despair and gloom. Stuart, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you stateside soon. Uh, Eileen, you will remain with us. Will Blitzer will join us. Michael Beschloss stays with us. This is Larry King Live. More tomorrow night, plus Pat Buchanan, an announced candidate for the presidency and an announced isolationist. More after this. First compact truck in America was an import, remember? Uh-huh. And then along came Ford Ranger. Now the best-selling compact pickup five years running. Ranger offers four-liter power, push-button four-wheel drive. Technology the imports can't match. Mm-hmm. So who sent who back to the drawing board this time? More people are driving the best-built, best-selling American trucks than ever before. Because sometimes the day ends and the pain doesn't, we've created Tylenol PM. It's more than relief. It's relief for those times when you can't sleep. Tylenol PM has extra strength Tylenol pain reliever to help stop your nighttime aches and pains. Plus a gentle ingredient to help you sleep. So you can wake up refreshed in the morning. From the name you trust comes Tylenol PM so you can rest easy. to celebrate Corbell Champagne. Hey, how about a little round bar? The Hawks on TBS. With us here in Washington is noted author, historian, student of Soviet affairs, Michael Beschloss. We'll also be going to Moscow momentarily with Wolf Blitzer and Eileen O'Connor. We certainly thank Stuart Lurie, the CNN vice president uh, who witnessed all of this today, along with President Tom Johnson, who is also on the scene. We'll be returning to Moscow in a moment. Michael, as I understand it, you were present or know the circumstances of Bush and Yeltsin's first meeting. September 1989, Boris Yeltsin shows you how far we've come in two years, came to the United States under the auspices of a California think tank, came to the White House, wanted to see President Bush. He rolled up at the side of the White House and was told to go to another entrance, and he said, this is not the entrance where state visitors call on President Bush. He was told, your visit is not with President Bush, it's with General Brent Scowcroft, the President's National Security Advisor. It was arranged that Yeltsin would see Scowcroft and Bush would drop by without photographers. That was at a time when the White House was very worried about offending Mikhail Gorbachev by embracing too closely his chief opponent. Will he regret that, Bush, do you think? I think not. Yeltsin has been graceful in the last few days and actually has been reminded about this. And he says, I was a parliamentarian at the time. I did not deserve a more auspicious meeting. At the time, however, he was not quite so graceful about it. What, Michael, worries you the most about this Commonwealth? Well, I think what worries me about the Commonwealth is the fact that it is dominated by a power, Russia, and a leader who has not shown a very great tendency to share power. As you remember, Larry, in August, Yeltsin and Gorbachev made a deal to share power and essentially have what might be called a doom virate. What we've seen over the last four months is progressively, progressively Yeltsin stripping Gorbachev of power, almost humiliating him in a way that suggests that he's getting back for the fact that Gorbachev fired him in 1987. 
You can make the argument that Yeltsin was quickly trying to get a hold of this government so there could not be a second coup, but it does not look very promising for a leader who has now said he's going to share power with a lot of leaders of a lot of lesser countries. You're a historian. Historians always guess. A hundred years from today, Gorbachev's place is what? Gorbachev's place is very large. Historical reputations always depend on how the story turns out, and that's still unfolding. We don't know what's going to happen in the former Soviet Union. But the important thing, Larry, is this. In 1985, there was a choice for leader of the Soviet Union. If Gorbachev's rival, Mr. Romanov, had been appointed, we'd still be in a Cold War. There would still be Soviet communism. It would be a very different world. It was almost a miracle that Gorbachev, whose private desire for reform was almost unknown to the people people who chose him came to power and undertook this revolution. So the right wing in America, which stayed kind of opposed to Gorbachev throughout, were wrong. I think they turned out to be wrong, especially because the alternative is so much uh, less desirable. Let's go to some calls. New York City, Michael Beschloss is with us. We're having some technical uh, transmission difficulties with Moscow, and as soon as we get him back, we'll go back to Russia. Hello. Uh, hi, Larry. Um, I was going to ask all of your guests to try to put a percentage on the chance for another coup attempt and where or who the main threat might be. I think we may very well see a number of coup attempts. There is nothing to say that the one in August was definitive. If you have over the next 18 months a situation where there is mass hunger in various uh, parts of the former Soviet Union, that really provides the tinder. There's a gentleman named Jernovsky who got 7 million votes running against Boris Yeltsin last year. He is not only a right winger, he wants to seize Finland, release the leaders of the August coup to come back into government. Government. This is a man who was a very dangerous threat from the right, and I think most people would say that if he ran today, he would get a lot more than 7 million votes. Transmission has returned to the Soviet Union, and with us, the very familiar Wolf Blitzer, CNN correspondent on hand in uh, Moscow, and we keep saying Soviet Union. And uh, Eileen O'Connor remains with us, the CNN correspondent based in Moscow. Wolf, your reaction to all of these events? Well, it's really been an incredible period for me as a journalist to just be here in Moscow and observe these events unfold, events that I don't think anyone could have anticipated only even a few months ago. It's really been one of the great stories, and 1991 started off with the Gulf War, which was obviously a big story for me, but it's ended up with this uh, dramatic transformation of what was the Soviet Union, which historically speaking, I'm sure in the 20th century, will turn out to be a much bigger story than the Gulf War. How quickly, Wolf, was this story sped along by the coup attempt? Could you repeat that? Uh, yeah. Line? How quickly do you think this story speeded up the change of guard by that coup attempt in August? I, I think it accelerated it a great deal. Uh, there's no doubt that all of the elements were in place for this uh, for this change, but the uh, the aborted coup in August certainly accelerated everything that unfolded. Gorbachev, uh, say what you will about him. Uh, and he was no doubt a great leader, but he was never democratically elected, something Boris Yeltsin was. And that's something I think that officials around the world, people around the world are going to have to remember, that uh, Gorbachev may have been a, a smoother character, someone uh, more likable to the West than, than Boris Yeltsin, but Boris Yeltsin certainly has the popularity here much more so than uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Well, if you're our military expert, what are you concerned about militarily? Of course, the, the number one question is the nuclear situation, 27,000, perhaps as many as 30,000 nuclear weapons. They're now concentrated in the four so-called nuclear republics, and supposedly over the next few months and perhaps years, all of them will simply be in Russia. The three other nuclear republics, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, and Belarus, have pledged to be non-nuclear. Uh, Secretary of State Baker received those assurances when he was here last week. If some of those uh, nuclear republics, one of those three, decides to try to back away from that commitment, there's some fear that perhaps Kazakhstan might, that would be a source of serious concern in Washington. I must say this, I traveled with Baker to Alma Ata, the capital of Kazakhstan, and there was a sense that I got there that the only reason Baker went to Alma Ata, some 3,000 miles away from Moscow, was because President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev controlled some nuclear weapons. 
And uh, Nazarbayev, who's a very shrewd, sophisticated politician, I'm sure recognizes that if he doesn't have those nuclear weapons, there's no great reason for a Secretary of State to make that journey to Alma Ata. And uh, Michael agrees, right? I not only agree, but you know, Larry, nuclear weapons confer power, and this is a very good example of it. We always hear about the fact they can't be used, can't be fired, perhaps, but if you have someone like Nazarbayev, who feels powerless as people are starving, he wants concessions from the West, you can have a potential for nuclear blackmail. Eileen, does, uh, does Robert Strauss uh, stay on? Is he now ambassador to Russia? Mr. Strauss is now the ambassador to Russia. Mr. Bush said that uh, um, the embassy here to the Soviet Union will now become the embassy to Russia and that there will be embassies set up in the Ukraine, in Belarus, and Kazakhstan, all the republics that uh, uh, Mr. Bush recognized. Um, but of course, the embassy here is huge. Right. They recognize that the Russian Republic is in fact the largest three quarters of the land mass, most of the resources, and clearly will remain the most powerful if Kazakhstan does secede its uh, nuclear weapons to Russia as it has said it would in the future. Russia will be the only one to remain a nuclear rep uh, republic or nuclear state in this part of the world. I agree with Michael that certainly nuclear weapons confer power. This country basically economically has been a third world country for the past almost 40 years. And one of its superpower status is completely derived from the nuclear weapons. But Gorbachev recognized that, that they've been falling so far behind um, economically and farther behind during the arms race. They couldn't keep up, especially with SDI. You know, at least in the United States, when we invest in, in research for arms, it trickles down into our domestic economy. Here, there were two levels under the old communist system. So that kind of money never trickled down, never became in, came into somebody's private computer or, or somebody's uh. typewriter or somebody's cash register. So they fell so far behind because of their society. And uh, now they can't catch up. And, and um, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. they will be able to economically. Eileen O'Connor, Wolf Blitzer, and uh, Michael Beschloss, Stuart Lurie earlier, back with more phone calls after this. Hello, I'm Susan Rook. At the top of the hour, momentous events today. The course of history is changed. Mikhail Gorbachev resigns. We will have comprehensive coverage. And did Christmas shoppers help the struggling U.S. economy? World News is right after Larry King. I knew stress was part of the job. But my first day really put me to the test. By the evening, the stress gave me a headache that was so bad, I didn't think the pounding would stop. Thank goodness one of the doctors gave me Tylenol. Imagine, with all the pain relievers they have at the hospital, they use what I use. It made a real difference. Then I could, too. Tylenol, the pain reliever hospitals use most. For those of you who have been reluctant to wear a hearing aid, Miracle Ear has more great news. If you have trouble hearing in noisy situations, the exciting Miracle Ear Clarifier may be your answer. The clarifier features a special filter that automatically reduces background noise. In a restaurant situation, it picks up the noises I want to hear, but the uh, other noises are just moved off into the background. If you or someone you know thinks they may be suffering from hearing loss, call Miracle Ear at this number and receive helpful information. It really makes a lot of difference in, in your way of hearing and your, in your way of life. Call this number. Miracle Ear will send you a booklet on better hearing, plus a coupon for a free hearing test. Call today. Learn about all the good news from Miracle Ear. A lot of people don't even, don't even know you got it, especially the one I got, the design that I got. Call this number. Find out if Miracle Ear can help you. The world is waiting outside. Inside, there's the good taste of Smuckers. Surprisingly, under 20 calories, and you're not adding any fat. A good way to start your day. With a name like Smuckers, it has to be good. There's one place you can turn for tips on everything. 
From design to new trends in science. All weekend long, watch special segments on living in the 90s, right here on CNN. What a day, and CNN, your eyes on it, 24 hours a day. Michael Beschloss, historian and student of Soviet affairs here in Washington and in Moscow. Wolf Blitzer, CNN correspondent. Eileen O'Connor, CNN correspondent. Earlier, CNN vice president, Stuart Lurie. We go to Dallas. Hello. Yes, with the uh, division of the Soviet Union, what is going to ensure that with all these countries being so close to each other, with a lot of different opinions and values and whatever, in this one large division, that this isn't going to turn into a large-scale Middle East problem in, say, 10 or 20 years, where they're fighting amongst each other and would also threaten the United States. Wolf? Well, I think that's a, that's a real concern. There are uh, over 100 different nationalities, 100 different languages. This is a huge, huge uh, commonwealth, and there's no guarantee that some of these long-simmering tensions, ethnic, religious, uh, nationalistic, some of these tensions could explode, and it's going to require all the statesmanship in the world to prevent that kind of explosion. Los Angeles, hello. Yeah, don't you think we should really be thanking Ronald Reagan for all this? Because he was the one who had the foresight to run the arms race because he knew that that was the only race we could win with the old Soviet Union. He said today, did Mr. Reagan, that uh, Gorbachev will live forever in history and all freedom-loving people owe him a great debt of thanks. What do they owe Reagan? Well, I think they owe Reagan a lot and really all the Cold War presidents. You know, this is almost like Alice in Wonderland. Larry, everyone wins and everyone gets a prize. Every Cold War president made a contribution. Ronald Reagan's, I think, was that in the early 1980s, he was able to convince the Soviet government that the U.S. had, a, had the will to indulge itself in the kind of arms buildup that we did. I think that had a lot to do in 1985 with the fact that they chose Gorbachev rather than someone who wanted to press on with the Cold War. Montego Bay, Jamaica, hello. Yes, I want to ask a question about the military base in Cuba, one in the south uh, side of the island facing the Caribbean and one near Havana facing uh, the Florida. I want to know what's going on. Yeah, who deals with Cuba now, Eileen? <laughs> well, so far, Mikhail Gorbachev has cut most of the Soviet aid to Cuba. He had already done that in the past. And Fidel Castro, when asked just a few weeks ago, um, who are your friends? And he said, no one. So it's not very clear what will happen. But certainly, I don't think any Soviet military will probably be left there. I don't think they can afford it. Uh, Boris Yeltsin has already withdrawn some of the Soviet military out of the trouble spots here, Azerbaijan and Armenia and uh, in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh and Georgia today because he said he wanted the internal problems in those regions to be resolved especially without Soviet troops, um, Union troops that were based down there. I'm not exactly sure what will happen. Maybe, Wolf, do you know anything about well, that? Well, there's no doubt that Cuba is isolated right now. This country is broke. In fact, Gorbachev in his speech today basically acknowledged that this arms race that the former Soviet Union was forced to endure over these past 40 years or so ba uh, made this country bankrupt, that it was a mindless arms race. He said uh, there's no threat facing this uh, commonwealth today, and what is necessary is to convert all of those defense uh, industries, all of that military expenditure to civilian productive purposes. I think there's going to be a, a tremendous reduction in military spending here. The four million man Soviet army is very quickly going to be a two million man uh, army and probably will go down to about one million uh, relatively uh, uh, relatively soon. That leaves Castro where, Michael? Leaves Castro dangling, the... dangling uh, getting his people to use mules instead of tractors. But the caller from Jamaica is worried about military bases. Though. Well, I think that's right, and worried that Castro might be a Samson trying to bring down the temple if he has nothing to lose. The people on the streets of Moscow say, why should we starve so that Castro gets subsidized oil prices? We'll be back with our remaining moments with Michael Beschloss uh, and Wolf Blitzer and Eileen O'Connor, Stuart Lori earlier. More tomorrow night. This is Larry King Live. Of course, 24 hours of coverage right here on CNN. Don't go away.